Hey everybody, Josh Sheridan here with the Barely Legal Podcast. They demand my alter ego, but I won't go. Because I On today's show, we have Christian Denman. Christian is a local. You go by Christian or Chris? I go by both. I'm a, a Gemini. Okay, well, there you go. Chris Christian uh, is a local attorney. Uh, his practice focuses primarily in family law and personal injury. Yeah, so we're primarily personal, personal injury. Personal injury. But we, I mean, we do a lot of, sure. lot of family. Uh, and you have offices in Pinellas, Pasco, Hillsborough County? And that's right. Okay. Uh, Christian has always been someone that I've admired because of his uh, acumen in running a business, uh, his, his marketing, his just understanding of running a small practice and i think his his knowledge and his his talent kind of exceeds that 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 profession in and of itself i you know i don't and i've had this conversation a lot of times with lee and I, i've wondered where you came from like you have this kind of advanced understanding of it and i don't know how you got there so that's been the primary driving factor of why i wanted to have you on the show we'll get there in a minute first off thank you for coming by of course now are you a florida guy originally or yeah, so I was born in uh, Buffalo. Okay, so I'm Southern New Yorker. Yeah, so Western New York. Man, alive! We get tons of these. We have, we have tons of Syracuse, Rochester, now Buffalo. It's I don't. I guess there's a big contingent. There, yeah, there's a huge exodus of people that yeah. come from Western New York and come down here, and you can just. You know, half the bars down here are, you know, Bills backers bars. Yeah, yeah. Right. So if you, I mean, just just go around. If you see Bills fans waving their flags and getting really drunk, that's down the here, reason. Yep, that's right. How old were you when you came down here? Uh, so I came down here at 11 or okay. 12. There was a, there was a layover in Maryland and DC. Okay. All right. Siblings. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, uh, so I have three brothers Okay. and then I had two sisters. Uh, they were stepsisters. So okay. we had a pretty big household. Big family. Yeah. Yeah. Three brothers, older, younger, right in the middle. I'm the oldest. You are? How's that? It's, um, uh, it was great growing up because yeah. I was bigger than them. Yeah. Right. You know, so you can kind of push them around. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, now that we're older and we need to help with our family more, you know, the the next layer, the older people, it's a lot. It's more responsibility, For which, sure. which, uh, which really kind of falls on my wife. If you've met my wife, she's so, so ridiculously competent. So yeah. The things I can't do, I just I just have her do. They live down here? And are any of them lawyers or? No, no, they're uh, complete. Uh, we're, we couldn't be more different. Okay. So, well, three of them, uh, uh, two live down here. Okay. The youngest, Alex, he's in LA. Okay. Um, he spent some time doing, uh, being a kind of a minor YouTube celebrity person. So he really? Would, yeah. So he'd come home and. Uh, and Anything juicy? It's just stupid, stupid yeah, shit, yeah. you know, like dumb stuff. Like you're like, I don't understand that. But, but the clearly, 13, the 14 year old, yeah. the 15 year old girls. And this is when he was in his early to mid 20s up to about 26, 27. They all understood it. Mm -hmm. So we, he'd come back for Christmas and, you know, the 13 year old girl would go, oh, dad. You know, we'd go into the liquor store and, oh, dad, look over there. That's, that's, you know, I forgot his name. That's, that's what's great about Florida is 13 year olds in liquor stores. That's the, yeah, I know. Right. You know, and that's the thing. You walk in like this is a little uncomfortable. And, yeah, yeah. This you know, is this is but this the dad's is my crowd. Like, what am I gonna do? Yeah. So she, I need in. some vodka, that's and right. I and I've got custody this weekend. So we're going <laughs> to the liquor store. That's exactly right. So that's funny. Um, so eleven years. So you went to school down here, high school, and all that, all that good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Right. Where'd you go to high school? King. Okay. So not too far from here. We yeah. Went, um, when my dad was in the SEC or okay. worked for the SEC in DC, and then he got his private job, you know, his big firm job sure. and, and he was a lawyer. Uh, and then he moved us down here and we were in the, the Brandon Valrico area. Back right. when it was like all, when it was all orange groves, yeah. you know, as far as the eye could see. Yeah. And, um, uh, but then I got shuffled into King for high school. Is he still with us? My pops? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. He's still here. He's still he's still working. He works at Carlton Fields. He's been oh, there. really? He's been there since I was a little kid. Big timer. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. So uh, he didn't shit talk it enough during your youth to get you to do something else. Uh, no. In fact, uh, um, it's not like that at all. So okay. when I was uh, so when I was little, my um, my parents been... were school teachers and said, if you're a fucking school teacher, we're going to disown you. So. They, they they wanted me to be an orthodontist, so I kind of landed in the middle of uh, the attorney. Yeah, <laughs> profession. Yeah, you got yeah, a profession. Yeah, yeah. When I was uh, when I was a kid, my mom and dad they they had split up when I was six, and my dad just thought my mom was crazy, uh -huh. and he went and moved to DC. We were in Buffalo, um, but it wasn't like hey that. It just crazy. Yeah. It was like she was sort of fly. She was crazy. She had she was a paranoid schizophrenic, and 
Um, so there was a couple of years, you know, where she was just a wreck, but nobody knew, nobody understood. How old know? were you at that time? Six, seven, eight. Oh, did that leave a print on you, you think? Yeah, but a positive one, I think, okay. you know, like it, like it was one of those things where she was, you know, line you up against the wall and be like, hey, you, you, you the, the bad guys put some glass on your Ooh. eyes, you need to burn it off, like really messed up. And oh, the wow. family didn't, it took the older people in the family a while to figure it out because if you've never seen that stuff, you just don't know. Plus yeah. she's a single mom. Um, so he's, you know, he had that like really bad period, but ultimately um, my dad, you know, he stepped up and he, he must've been 26 years old. He was a single guy, single a attorney in DC. He figured out what was going on and he did all the lawyer stuff and they came and they grabbed us and um, and we lived with him, which was kind of cool for a while. Like yeah. three boys and your dad, right? Yeah. And um, so what year would you have been in DC? Uh, so it had been 80, uh, 80, 87, 88, oh, wow. something like that. You weren't much into music. Though. I guess you were probably pretty young at that time. Yeah, at that like point. Not, not a lot of six-year-olds at Fugazi concerts. And no, no, that would have been, no, that would have <laughs> been um, Beach, oh, Bon Jovi, Slippery When Wet. Oh, that's the Gravitron soundtrack. Yeah. And then other than that, it would have been taping Casey Case. Case oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. All right, all right. But uh, but yeah. So and then I had a, then after that, I had this great childhood where everything was taken care of. Every, you know, everything was where it needs to be, and yeah. it was safe. And so I just and then my dad, he had a nice car and nice house. And I was like, you know what, Dad, I think I want that. Like yeah. I want the safeness. Yeah. Um. And of course, then um, then instead of going for working for a big firm, I started my own business. So it didn't work out quite that way. Were you an athlete? Were you an artist? Were you an academic? What was what was little. Yeah, a little, a little, a little bit of all of it. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing great in any realm. I, I did the nerd school. It was IB. And yeah, shuffled in for that, and um, and I wrestled for for what three, wrestle? three years. A oh, one hundred and three. Right. And you, you until and I ever get after it, be a wrestler too. Yeah, I can't. I mean, get you guys drunk like, enough. I think I think we could make some money off of that. You know, I think a barely legal wrestling. No, the problem is catch the, weight. At least strong. And Lee's big too. Yeah. So, you know, he's, he's a big boy right now. So he's lost some weight, Yeah. but he's, you know, he, he, and he's a strong dude. Yeah. So I don't really, I'd have to get pretty drunk. I think you're scrappy, man. I think you could move around on him, get him tired. Well, I would, I mean, I'd win, but I'd win by be cheating. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'd find a way there'd yeah. be a finger and then because yeah. you know, I'm competitive and I'm yeah. older than him. So yeah. I want to win, but, uh, uh, but I think a finger in the with Christian Denman. You just titled your podcast. Yeah, <laughs> check, check in the oil with Christian. Yeah, check Denman. in the oil with Christian Denman. So, um, so your dad kind of was a, a vision of safety, of 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 you know practicality, and 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 with kind of the lifestyle that you wanted to lead. So, um, high school and then college. Where'd you go to college? Gators, UF. So it's uh, UF and where I didn't, I, you know how people are nuts about being Gator fans. Yeah, so. Are you not? No, I am. You I, are. Okay. Yeah, but I didn't have any of that. Are there any out. people that aren't? I was just having a conversation yeah, the other day. They transfer. Is that you know, what it was? They just didn't get the paper <laughs> Yeah, or, or they came in, you know, they went to the community college first, so they only had two years. They didn't have that freshman indoctrination. I was having a conversation, I think it was yesterday, with uh, Greg Th Thacker, Damian McKinney, and Anthony Franca, that I want to smack the shit out of everyone with a golf cart in South Tampa, and that primarily they have a Gator sticker or a Seminole sticker on the back. Do you have a, do you have a golf cart? No, I, I okay. don't. All right. You're giving me that look. I was like, oh, I'm just going to end. <laughs> gotta, no, I'm, not, this one short. I'm not part of the golf cart. The uh, golf cart uh, mafia. Clan. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, so how, how were, how were your, how was your time there? Did you love it? Was it everything that. It was, you know, when people say that college is the best time of their yeah. lives and that that's, that was true. That school and that community is so amazing because it's literally right in the middle of like clan country, but it, you know, it's. <laughs> You know, it's a fun, fun <laughs> campus, but I've, I've been to a Sonny's barbecue on the outskirts. Uh, what's the, is it Haines City or what's, I went to a Woodser there. Did you ever go to a Woodser when you were in? Oh man, you're taking me back. I had, yes. it was Crown Royal and Mountain Dew at a Woodser. Oh God, I blacked out. I, I don't even know what happened for the greater part of oh, that, that weekend. sugary wonderfulness. Oh yeah. my God. It just burned. I, I think I still have like acid reflux 30 years later from that <laughs> night in, in the Woodser. It's like, I don't even know what, what, what went on there. But anyway, so law school was at UF or did you do? That was Arkansas. Okay. Yeah. So that's um, so 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 Gainesville wasn't no, yeah, you, well wasn't red enough for you. you well, no, to, you Gainesville, to to Gainesville wouldn't take me. That was oh, the problem. Okay, okay. So Gainesville, you know, my grades are it, I couldn't get into UF, and sure. so then it was like, well, where do I go? Um, and Arkansas. I I applied to SEC schools. 
Is that what it was? Stupid as it is. I, okay. I needed something, right? No, and, is, and it wasn't it like as I, much you know, sense as any other I'm not thing. Going, I'm not going to I'm not going to an Ivy League school. Just sure. what the grades weren't there. Sure. Right? That's not happening. So sure. I just applied to SEC schools. They're state schools. Okay. Um, and then the one that gave me that was a mixture of being a decent school, looked like a cool environment, a new adventure, and gave me lots of money. So I didn't have any, you know, it wasn't right. have those loans. How'd you find Arkansas? How, they, I just really applied no, to I SEC mean, schools. How, how did oh, you how did enjoy? Yeah, it? yeah. Uh, I I loved it. Did you? I made some of the best friends yeah. uh, of my life. Friends that are, I still have today. Good people. Um, I learned to hunt and, and shoot guns really? and fish and all those things I just never did. Sure. My dad was the you know yeah. more city city boy, you know, yeah, right? Yeah. And so um, yeah, I did all that fun stuff and camping and going canoeing down the river and, and I never noodled, never yeah. noodled for catfish, yeah. but yeah, it was fantastic. So, uh, out of law school, did, did, did you know you were coming back to Tampa or? Yes. Did yeah. you so, do anything before you went out on your own or did you immediately go out on your yeah, own? Yeah, I was a, a PD. You were? Yeah. What county? Yeah. So I was a PD in the sixth. Were we there at the same time? I, I don't think so. I think I, I must have graduated. Because I didn't know you were there. Yeah. Yeah. So I graduated 06. So I left then, 2005 from the state attorney's all office. Right, so I would have just missed you. So I graduated 06. I, I stuck around a little bit longer in Arkansas. And then I, I studied for the bar there. And then, you know, once I was barred, I came back to Florida, looked for a job. That was the first job I got. And is that how you met Nicole? Yeah. So I think she came right at, she was there before you, right? She was at the state before you were right at the, like right at the same time. Like she was an intern. So she might've been there a little bit before me as an intern. Yeah. Somehow I knew her, uh, I mean, later I came to know her for different reasons, which I'll avoid talking about. <laughs> but um, uh, I felt like we worked there at the same time. But anyway, so, okay, that how, how was working for Dillinger? I, I, I thought he was great. He you seems know? like a rad guy, like as a counterpoint to Bernie. Like, I, I really think I ended up in the wrong office there. Um, you know, I was like the the black sheep liberal of that office. I, I, Jesus. I don't I, I know there were others of us, but like none of us like, you know, I, raised our hands and made it. No, 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 no. You're like, no, convictions, convictions yeah, all the way. Let's, yeah, let's convict yeah, them yeah. all. You were on a bike and you were drinking <laughs> fucking, you know, driving without a license yeah. to jail with you. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was rough. So did you do, how many years did you do there? Uh, a little bit less than three, I think. Yeah. Maybe. They don't, they don't kind of do that same deal that the state does where they, they, they like did. had to do your three. No, it wasn't like, um, that. what judges did you have? Carbio. Okay, he was he was a, a he was a PD with me in front of Freeman, I think. Yeah, Judge I always Car love Carballo. He's like a who does he remind me of? He reminds me of like three different movie stars in general. Who's the guy that's in Billions and he was in? He played pig vomit in the Howard Stern movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, I'm not sure. It sounds I'm, like I'm insulting I, yeah, the judge. I know, it's, it's actually a very well-known actor that I love you, Judge Carbio. Yeah, but but in any event, he, he reminds me of also that. known as Pig Vomit. <laughs> well, that's going to kill me now. So so anyway, so um, so who else did you have as far as judges? Uh, a judge Malone when I was in Felony Land. He was Benson. my LTA when I was oh, a was state right? attorney. Yeah. Um, so did you do out finish out your career in front of Judge Malone? Yes. He he reminds me of like Kramer, like very you know dry weird personality extremely dry very so. dry sense of sense of humor i'm just going to insult every judge that you've ever uh yeah no he was he was a good he, i thought he was a good judge he didn't you know we didn't see eye to eye on things like the fourth amendment paul giamatti is who i'm thinking Paul's, oh i can bio see reminds that. me of so. i can see that so that's not an insult i mean giamatti's cool i mean the, the pig vomit character is yeah that, that's not so um any murder cases nope nope it's lucky um, so then right out, right out on your own. Yeah. So I, I met Nicole. I mean, I knew of Nicole cause Nicole was pretty attractive mm -hmm. and I, you know, once or twice I may have walked into her courtroom and just sat, you just, just kind of like, you yeah. know, I was like, I'm going to hit on her yeah. if I get the opportunity, but I, I didn't for a bit. Uh, but then we had some DUI trials together. So okay. there was an opportunity I could say, Hey, you know, we're done here. Let's go have a yeah, drink. Yeah. And, um, Whoever wins, you know. Yeah, right, right, right. right. So, um, but then, you know, then we, we fell in love and uh, we like within a two month period, I think we got, we got hitched, bought a house, left. Uh, the, she was at the state, she was state attorney and I was a PD. We left the office and then we opened up our shop, like all like right there, like at the same time. And originally was it criminal defense and family only or? It was criminal defense and estate planning. Where did the estate planning so, come from? So um, Nicole has a, has a, 
very good estate planning uh, and now a good probate practice. So oh, she wow. represents um, her dad was a financial planner okay. and knew those sorts of people. Sure. And so that's kind of like her introduction. When right. we, our first office was on Main Street, which was 5701 Main Street. Her nice. dad's office was 5703 Main Street. Yeah. So our next door neighbor. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, yeah. yeah, that's how it started. And she just kind of had a little niche thing. So she, it's always been a, it's never been her 100% of her practice. Right. But she knows it inside out and up and down. And uh, so I mean, she's been doing that for more than a decade. And she's got a, you know, and then eventually you take care of those people. And she learned, you know, up in New, up in Pasco, it's a different way of doing things than maybe down here. Oh, for sure. You know, it's like you you become their lawyer, like right. their lawyer for, for everything. For everything, yeah. and you're you're gonna get calls, and you're gonna get, you know, Christmas. You're gonna get cookies. I mean, the amount of cookies we get in our Pasco oh, office is unbelievable. My Dade City clients always are like, "Where you got to go out on the boat with us this weekend?" Or, That's you know, right. It's That's always, right. Yeah, it's a different world. Yeah, Mine but, was blanket chip. <laughs> anyway. But, uh, but, and then over time, but, you know, she had an older clientele base and some started to pass away. And so over time, she became a probate attorney as well. Wow. So I left, uh, so I graduated from law school in 2002. I was a prosecutor until 2005. I went out on my own in 2005. And everything I, ha I have learned in that period of time is by fucking up just massively. <laughs> <laughs> and whether it's staffing, marketing, I've pissed away so much money on Thompson West. I've I've had a lot. Uh, I've had a lot of employees. I've had no employees. I've and for me, I, I feel like in the past three to four years, I've started to make some headway in understanding the racket, but. It's a tough one to nail down and it's a vector and it's not, you know, whatever, whatever works this month doesn't work next month. Whatever works this year doesn't work next year. And I have watched you and your practice, I would say in the past eight years, 10 years, just grow in size and in reach and in reputation and in all these things. And it's just been very impressive to me. And I, I talked to Lee a good deal about it. Uh, and you know, he, he can't ever give me a, 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 a true response that's not filled with insults and, <laughs> you know, a sense of humor and all this other stuff. But I, that's kind of one of the bigger questions I wanted to ask you is it seems like just through tyranny of will, you've taught yourself how to run a business. I mean, did, did you have a background? I mean, did your dad's experience help you? Did you have other people who run businesses in your family? How much of it is, you know, just a collaborative effort between you and Nicole? Like, how did you figure it out? Not that you've reached like, you know, I don't think you were ever yeah, done figuring it out. But of course, of but course. You, you definitely seem to be ahead of the curve. And I'm just wondering how you account for that. So, you know, a lot of business people have that story about selling this when they're kids. I, I, none of that, like mm -hmm. none of that whatsoever. Uh, I went to college and um, you know, majored in finance. And, uh, and so some understanding of money, I know that some sounds yeah, yeah, a, yeah. small, but it doesn't make any sense to you when you don't have any, right? right? It's, right all, yeah. it's all, yeah, it's, it's all, all esoteric, yeah. right? Um, and, and then I, I had a, I had a law class and I, I read a, I read a book by a guy named Richard Posner. And I'm not even sure looking back if I actually understood what I was reading because right. it's probably over my head. And he's a really smart dude from the University of Chicago. That name rings a bell to me for some reason. Yeah. I feel like he's I a, like a legal, what do they call it? Philosopher, okay. you know, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, and uh, anyways, I had this class and I was supposed to read this book and it was very, very thick. Um, but in the beginning of the book, I don't know if I finished the book, but it's something that resonated was the idea that law is a, um, that we have barriers to entry if you want to be a lawyer mm. that in at least at that time that if you want to own a law firm you have to be a lawyer yeah. you know um if you want to open up a, a restaurant anyone can do that but to be a lawyer and open up a lawyer shop you know you have to go through these things so the competition is going to be less we always you know we bitch in florida like oh there's so many lawyers and that's true but that's only compared to other states you know it's not like i mean how many restaurants are there how many in other know? industries it's not yeah right and so and, and again this is not like the it's you know it's not it's not like it's some glorious thought. I just like, Hey, that sounds like, <laughs> that's like a better path. Like I, I, I just had a hair up my ass that I wanted to go into business for myself. I didn't have any good reason why my uncle had run a small carpet cleaning business, but that, you know, it was a small business. I just wanted to, I thought I did. And, uh, and that seemed like a good way to do it. And like I was saying it, I knew that I'd be safe if I did the law. It, it just, I saw what my dad did. It made sense. I had a template to look at, sure. even though he, what, you know, he works for a big firm, but 
th- that's it. I mean, that's how I went and did it. And so, and like, do but I? That's have- getting into it. Any, but okay, you you got your you got your bar card, and okay, you know, you saved up five grand to get your first month's rent, a desk, and a computer. But there's so much more to that. There's so much more to to, and and this is kind of more of my question is, um staffing staffing is hard to do right it's hard to it's like dating people you know you get through you know everybody seems great the first week and then at 90 days or at six months it's like oh now i understand so and and staffing it correctly because you know you're getting busy or okay let's buy more staff oh wait it slowed down and now i'm overstretched on salary and maybe i overshot the mark and staffing it. And, you know, is it better for me to specialize just in family law? Because uh, most clients want family law right. law firms. Right, right. Or most clients want PI law firms. And God forbid you should do two practice areas because now it's like, which one are you pretending it? You know, th- there's all <laughs> these things that, you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly so, what you're talking about. So you're you're giving me the checkers answer. I want the chess answer. Like like it was more than a philosophy book that you read. Like you have you have figured things out. Sure, and I think I was kind of long winded, but I was just saying I didn't know anything when I got started. Sure, but when we opened up our, sh- did, we all make dumb mistakes. We blew our entire this morning every penny already. we had when we opened up our business. We blew everything on this. We had this building on Henderson, this like triangle of cheese. I remember it, yeah. And we we were like, well, we just, let's put a Denman Denman and Denman in gigantic fucking letters Mm -hmm. on the building. So we put every penny we had in these Because roadside business is where it's at. Everybody's like, I need a PI attorney. Let me pull into this parking lot. Everyone will look at the (laughs) sign. And then we had one billboard, right? We got one billboard. And everyone will look at the sign and the one billboard. And then they shall come. Did you do the PPC? Have you fallen into the pay-per-click world? Well, if I had it all over again, I would have been deep, deep. I would have taken out loans yeah. and been deeper in PPC back when we started, which is back in 2009. Yeah. Everything's so expensive now. But, yeah. you know, I think in the divorce realm, what was it like 40 bucks a click or yeah, somewhere yeah. like that? It used to be like five bucks a click, you yeah. know, and in the, what you charge is not that much different now. So I wish that we had gone all back, then. back then. Back right. Then. Right. So I, I, uh, you know, I, I when I left the state, I said, I'm not going to be able to just do it on criminal defense alone. Now, this was two years before the market took a shit. And back then you could get some good money on some sex cases, some trafficking cases, all that kind of stuff. Right. You could get 20, 30 grand on those cases. Uh, then the housing market went bust and everybody was like, why am I going to pay for an attorney? I got I got conflict counsel or I've got PD's office. Or I've got free, you know, so you're dealing against free competition. Um, and I said, you know, I'm going to have to find something else that I can do. And in a, in a, in a rare moment of insight and brilliance, I said, what is it that no one else wants to do? <laughs> because there's going to be plenty of work there. And, you know, if you ask 10 attorneys what type of work to avoid, nine of them are going to tell you divorce and family. Divorce, I would never do that. Yeah, much, well, right? you got to be crazy to do that work. And so I was like, okay, well, I might be able to scrape together some clients in that world. And jump right in. And jump right in. And two weeks being out, I got referred a case from Bill Bennett. Uh, and it was a divorce trial in front of Mike Andrews. Uh, and, uh, Chuck Holloway was on the other side and it was literally that meme that you see of people dividing up beanie babies on the floor. And it was just such a interesting trial by fire in the family law sector. But so I did that. (laughs) I did that for about 10 years and all the time, all my family and friends were like, why don't you do PI? Why don't you do PI? Why don't you do PI? And I had this weird, what was it? What was the phrase you used earlier, barriers to entry or, yes. so I had perceived this barrier to entry that you needed to have like a war chest of like a hundred thousand dollars liquid to start doing PI cases to f- cover all your expert costs and, you know, all the shit that goes into those cases. And I just was like, oh, I'm never going to have a hundred grand sitting around doing family law and criminal defense post 2008 to get into it. Um, but in around 2012, uh, a former client of mine came to me and said, I'm about to graduate from law school and I'd like to do personal injury. And I was like, well, here's the thing is I'll take care of all your startup costs. I'll take care of all your marketing costs. I'll take care of all your everything. 
but you're going to have to build it because I don't have five seconds to scratch my ass with all the other stuff that I'm doing. And so that's when Christian Pipus started working for me. And the thing about Christian is two things that I think you've got to Lee doesn't have it. You're good looking and <laughs> you got street smarts. I'm just fucking like, um, but Christian, you know, had those two things. He was young. He was unattached. He didn't have, he wasn't married. He was a young guy. He was out every weekend and all sure. this other stuff. And guys wanted to be him and girls wanted to be with him. And in side of six months, we built, we had like a hundred, a book of like a hundred PI clients. Now, I mean, the, the number of PI clients can be deceptive because, you know, 98 of those can be like, you know. Well, yeah, 98 are slip and fall. Yeah, I was crossing the street and got hit by right, someone right, who had right. no license or insurance. It's like, yeah, you got 98 dog shit cases. But, um, you know, we they weren't. He, it was a nice book of cases. And he just had this understanding of that. And I've always built the PI up to be this kind of rubik's cube and it's i I don't know why i've built it up i I think it's because of how hard it was for me to become good at family law and understand family law well it was an exhausting process and just the prospect of having to do that again has always been why it's like i just want to bring someone in so there's pipus and we have marie now who's doing very well with it and her husband ryan does insurance defense but um the pi thing this is a long-winded entryway into what I was talking about. So this is when I started to get a better understanding of the business part of this. And it was the concept of time for money versus not time for money. So with family law, you can the the the, the market will only allow you to charge so much money. And if you're board certified, you can charge a little bit more, but you're probably not going to be able to charge much more than 400, 450 an hour, right? I mean, at the end of your career, that's probably the most you're going to be getting unless you're Cliff Curry or some of these other people. And you've only got 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week. So just you, no staff, no other people with you. That's the most you're ever going to be able to make. Right. And I remember at some point years ago reading Robert Kiyosaki. Have you ever read Robert Kiyosaki? Rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever read it? Or are you familiar read with the it, concept yeah, read of it? it? Read it in college and reread it again a couple of years ago. So the concept of passive income or leveraging income sources started to become clear to me in the process, in the, in the, in the context of a law office that effectively your paralegals and your associates are your rental houses. These are your passive income sources. And so all these little points in my life, I, I've kind of culled together over time. So that was one thing that started to like clue me in about building up that type of work. And then another thing was I had a buddy of mine, uh, Zach Neward, who manages hedge funds. And he was telling me, I was there was at one point another friend of mine from high school. I'm sorry, I'm so long winded. I'll let you talk at some point. <laughs> a friend of mine from uh, high school, he uh, Larry Park, and he does some of that for SunTrust. And uh, I was asking him way back when I was like, "What does it take to be in a hedge fund?" And he's like, "He's like, I think I think the buy-in, the lowest buy-in is like five hundred thousand or something like that." So this was ten some odd years ago. So then skip ahead to maybe a year or two ago, I was talking to Zach and I said, what does it take to buy into a hedge fund? He's like about 10 million is probably the lowest. I was like, who has fucking $10 million? Like, who are these people? And he's like, this is the point. And he's like, either they inherited it or they learned how to sell time. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he's like, well, you charge someone 50 bucks for something you're paying your person 10 bucks to do and you collect the difference. And I was like, okay, this, this, this is again, getting into this whole Kiyosaki mold. And then the final kind of piece of this, and I still haven't fully crystallized it in, into a sound theory yet, but I think there's something there and it's, it's the uh, money ball concept, which is, I think people focus on the wrong thing when they're running a business. Uh, I think there's a get, let's get on base mentality. And what does that mean in the, in the context of the work that we do? Because, you know, we can, what he said, Brad Pitt says it's something in the aggregate, we can emulate that, which we can't do. You know, they lost Johnny Damon and they lost all these other people, but they got together all these league right, minimum right. people and the stats kind of got them there. So I've, 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 all of that has gotten me to, 
kind of where I'm at and my understanding of this now, which, and, and don't even ask me to explain it to you further than that, because I'm not sure that I can, but I, I feel like I've got something there. So, but with PI, the great thing and why it's so saturated and wrongful death and med mal and all this is you can have a windfall effectively for the amount of time. Like I remember when I started doing it, I went and did a, a slip and fall and, uh, another Christian, Christian Meyer, I was mediating it with him. And, you know, we ended up getting like 150, 160 grand on this case where the lady stepped on a piece of uneven pavement and hit her head and had a subdural hematoma. And I mean, maybe 10 hours into that case and that netted us like $50,000 in attorney's fees. And I was just thinking, how much shit did I have to go through in a divorce to get to that, that revenue, you know, that amount of revenue. And it was like, Obviously, this needs to be part of the business because it's just from a financial perspective, it doesn't make sense to refer it out. It doesn't make sense to not do it. So I'm not sure if there was a question in there, but I'm interested in your thoughts on everything that I just said. Yeah, no, so for, hopefully you were listening. And yeah, for sure, for sure, man. Yeah. So um, it, at the end of the day, people want value. I'm not right? asking for trade secrets, but I, I, just, and, well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what we yeah, do, but yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, people want value, right? So. Um, and what does it matter in PI? PI opens your eyes to say, wait a second, all that matters is that I get a result. Right. The client doesn't care whether it takes me 500 hours or five hours. It doesn't matter. And really, why should it matter? I mean, do you, what do you want a gold star? It took yeah. you a lot of time, yeah. right? So in PI, you realize it's about delivering a result. And then you say, okay, the quicker I deliver this result, the better the client becomes happier, right? Mm -hmm, right? And I do better because I'm paying in PI, you're usually paying your staff members like a salary or you know, hourly or whatever the case may be. So if it takes you three years to close a case for $200,000. You're netting way less money. Yeah. Right, then if you do the same thing in one year. Right. right. Plus, you know, the value of the money and it's in all those things and it's better to have money today than tomorrow. And we all know PI cases, they can fall apart sometimes the longer it goes. People don't want to treat over the course of a case. Right. You know, or, things yeah. happen. So PI opens your eyes to what really what business is supposed to be about. Sure. Right? Divorce, it's 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 the billable hour model. The clients don't like it. We, we don't know they don't like it. We don't really like it because we because it sucks, sucks to have to do time. Sucks. Uh, and it sucks to realize, wait a second, this is the best I can do. Right. Yeah. You start adding up your hours, yeah. right? There are some attorneys, there's a guy, there, there's a firm called Rosen uh, out of um, North Carolina, I think. And Rosen is now since retired and um, he has other people running his business. But he's for years done nothing but fixed fee with divorce. I know Pete Hobson has done that. Well, and he just only does it. Yeah. And so here's the beauty of doing fixed fee the way he does it. It's 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 going to be it's expensive. These are not cheap. He's yeah. not doing the bottom cases. No right. one's coming in for a twenty five hundred dollar uncontested right. divorce. It's, yeah. This is going to be fifteen grand. Yeah. And then if we go to the next step, it's this. If we're going to do a deposition, you get three depots included. Every other depot is going to be fifteen hundred bucks. Chinese menu or yeah yeah. It, but the thing is, the, even though his clients may end up spending more at the end of the day, the right client who understands it is would rather have that. They'd rather pay more because they're, they don't have the risk of, oh my God, what if my crazy yeah. soon to be ex. They're not going to get outspent. Go, yeah. What, you know, what if she just runs it and turns it into a $150,000 divorce? Right. So it's for the right client, you actually, and you can build that into your prices and you can sell that to the client too. Now we've done very little of it. And, and that's just because we just haven't gone in that direction, but I watched that, you yeah. know, and that's interesting. And I think that's, I think Tampa, I think the Tampa Bay area, somebody's going to do that. And they're going to do it right. And they're going to do it with big numbers and they're going to get that money and they're going to, they're going to advertise it and they're going to make that as part of what they're selling yeah. and they're going to get that money. It's but, interesting. Uh, I mean, I've seen a lot of people do that poorly. Uh, and uh, Pete Hobson, you know, Joe Hobson, yeah. Pete's, you know, Pete Hobson. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love those guys. Um, they're crazy, but I, I <laughs> but Pete kind of does a similar thing. He's like, you know, everything not including a trial is 10. Then if it's a trial, it's another five. And then if it's that, that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I, it would be just the just the possibility of a future where I'm not having to input time because, you know, I, the conversation with people is like he's like, you're charging me for an email. And it's like you have to understand that that's my commodity. That is my product that I'm selling you is my time and whatever counsel I'm giving you. And even at that, I, I don't bill a point one. I bill a one minute average per email, which is better for the clients, although it sucks in trying to collect fees in a hearing because it's effectively unit pricing, which, you know. Right, right. Which you can't do. Yeah. Well, yeah. But think about, and this, again, this is what sucks in divorce. I mean, think about 
you are obviously going to do whatever you can to do what's best for your client. You don't want to charge your client more. You want to delegate down to paralegals. Of right. course, we all do. But we're all human at the same time. And we are, you know, as an attorney, you're subconsciously, if you're billing, you're billing. Yeah. But when you do something like PI and you realize it doesn't matter who the hell does the work, it doesn't matter if an app or if a computer, you know, if we get some conditional logic sure. and we build some badass forms that do the work. Right. It, it's a total mindset. You're like, how can I get this work done? I mean, there are certain work, there's certain work that you have to do and you have to put lots of time right. in. You're preparing for a hearing or, or a trial and you got to put, and you want to put that time in. You're, you got a great case and you really want to prepare your client up and you want to be there and you want to go to your client's house and, and make them feel comfortable and, and break bread with them and really take the time. That's, that's good use of your time. But when you're, but there are a lot of other things, it's not a good use of your time to do. And so you learn that with, because PI, because you realize that there's going to be a set amount of money. Obviously you learn how to get, make more, you know, sure. we track, for example, what our average case value is. And we want to make sure that that's, you know, doubling every year because sure. that means we're getting better and better and better. But you start saying, okay, well, why do I have this person, this, the, why do I have this particular team member anyways, right? I don't, maybe I don't need this one. Why do I have this person doing this low level work? Why don't I automate it? And then you're like, well, we all have Clio forms or whatever it is that, you know, we have these different, you know, template forms where, but why am I doing that? Why don't, why don't I get some good conditional logic software and make it so that I can, I can press five buttons in whatever PI form I want whatever version of the complaint I want, it can be done. And we did that. We spent a lot of money doing it, but, but it saves us so much time. And so now instead of having, you know, instead of having a $50,000 a year employee doing that, we eliminated that position. My paralegal does it, my right hand guy, but it really literally takes them five seconds. And then everybody knows we have a meeting every month and we make our forms better. And we go back to the company and they put it in. And they but everything it. you just described, you describe it as though it's it's obvious and it's not obvious. Like, how do you account for figuring that out? Um, I mean, do you spend a lot of time thinking about this? Do you spend a lot of time researching it? Do you spend a lot? Yeah. So so here's how. So um I didn't know anything, right? But I realized I needed to figure out and get good at it. So I started reading, it's so corny, but just started reading books, yeah. you know? And I started in the legal profession, right? Well, who's successful? You know, lawyers love to tell you how successful they are, yeah. right? So, well, John Morgan's successful and he's written a book. So I bought his book you yeah. know? and I looked at it. I'm actually recently bought his, he's got a couple books, you know, there's the, and these are just a couple I've read recently. You know, Mike Morris is a guy in Detroit who's built up like a, I don't know, uh, like a hundred million dollar a year firm. He's got a really good PI practice, um, but he wrote a book. So I go grab the book. Right. right. Um, and then there are other books that are based on business. There's, you know, just a handful that are really good. It started like everyone should start, you know, maybe six, seven years ago. Now, eight years ago, I started with Michael Gerbo's E-Myth, right. Mm -hmm. Which everyone should read to get your mind thinking the right way. So anyways, you can, you get, there are certain books. It's all been done by someone else before. Right. That's the key. I mean, that's the thing. Right. And so when I'm at a certain level, you know, I'm looking for how to get to the next level. I find the right books that are going to show me the path. I, I very few original ideas, very few. But um, you have a drive and you have a you have a desire uh, and not a complacency about you. And um, psychologically, where do you think that comes from? Is it a competition? Is it a is it a what, what gives you that drive? Yeah, I mean, I just want to be better than I was the day before. If it was a competition, if I was one of those guys that's hard, hardwired that way, I mean, I, I'd like to think that I have a, I, you know, my firm would be 10 times the size it is right now if right. I was wired that way. But, you know, I, I, I want to do good, but I, I have balance in my life. When we're done here, you know, every Friday, I, it's date night with my wife, the grandkid, you know, the grandparents are watching the kids. Right. And, uh, you know, I'll work a little bit on the weekend, but not a lot. You know, how many kids do you have? So we got uh, three little girls. And how old are they? 12, seven and brand new. Well, one. Really? I didn't. Re yeah, no, I guess I did realize that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's another thing is the work life balance, you know. So this is this is another thing that kind of I spent a lot of time thinking about is I could be growing more quickly, doing better, but it would be at the expense of being a good father and a good good husband. Right. My wife and I, too, have the Friday night date night. And I, I, I was blessed and cursed for, by being socially like a recluse. Like, I don't like going out to bars. I don't hang out with friends. I don't do any of that shit. So I most so 20, 2020 is your year. That is. That oh, yeah. I was like, I was like, so I didn't even realize <laughs> new? What happened? I didn't even know anything had happened. Yeah. But uh, but my kids are, you know, that that that's what tickles me. Like, you know, so being around them and I think about that a lot. And so, you know, I know that 
as I'm sure you are, like I could, I could be in here at four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning. Like you get way more done before the, the, the bell rings or the bell rings at the end of the day because people aren't calling you, but that's time that I could be with my kids. So I have difficulty there. Right. It's, 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 what do you want? Yeah. Right. And everyone, you know, to each, you know, we got to be true to our own selves. Right? right. So I, you know, there, it's not like a or B it's not, it's not yes or no, it's not binary. Right. Right. You know, we, we all fall on a scale. You just got to, you know, we're kind of at that age now that we can be, you know, self-reflective and say, okay, this is what I want. How old but, are you? Uh, 41. Okay. Right. Uh, but what you, what you, sh- what you should be thinking about is sometimes the things that you think about and that you spend time on today, if from a money perspective, they can have a compound effect and a certain unit of time that you use today, if you use it the right way and you put the effort in to figure out what you need for your business, you know, that might give you 10 units, you sure. know, in five years from now. And, and that's why divorce is tough. And that's why I'm glad to hear that you have those other divisions because divorce is because of the hourly billing, as long as we're doing that, the only way to make, you can do it in divorce though. You know, I mean, my wife worked for uh, Sandy Solomon. I'm friends with Mike Lundy. I mean, I've seen yeah, these people. You can do it, but you, it's, it's a staffing model though. It's about the people. It's about like, you know, the mechanical Turk. So you can do it. And yeah, and Lundy, you know, he's got a great you know, big firm and I'm, he's killing it. He's a great businessman. So you can do it that way. And, sure. you know, it's been done staffing model. So, yeah. You know, um, but if that's not your, your, your bag and you don't want to be the person that's going to be managing all that, and that seems more complex, you have to find other ways to basically get more revenue per labor dollar is what it really comes down to. And I've, and I've, you, you're using vernacular that key, keys me into the type of thinking that I've been doing more in research. Did you ever read uh, From Zero to One, Peter Thiel's book? Uh, I read a little bit of it. I didn't finish it. Okay. He has a wild dude. He is a wild dude. But there was some there was some pretty interesting theories in business there about creating a lane that didn't exist before. And, and that's something that I've thought about a lot with marketing. And, you know, I had for years spent so much money on, like I said, Thompson West and all this stuff. And it's like we all, especially early in our careers, pay money to these groups who are doing the same job for everybody. And it's like. I'm paying you to build the same website that you're building for every one of my colleagues to do the same blog that you're doing for every one of my colleagues. God, to that's do so funny. And you, that's a great, <laughs> it's funny to think that back in time, but we did that because we didn't know, know any better. We were just like, well, let's do what everyone else is doing as if in some way that will go ahead and put us. And in it's the head of the like, pack. what is it? Right. Ri- it was rising tides raise all ships or right, something, right, you know, right, it's, right. it's similar type of thing. So, I got the idea and it worked until she freaking got engaged and moved to Atlanta. I got, I got the idea is, and I'm sure this is something that you came upon earlier than I did, but I want my own mark. I want my own person. I want my own person that comes into our office and all they're working on is our stuff and no one else gets the benefit of our stuff. And you know, if I have this idea, hey, I want to start doing a podcast, I can walk 10 feet down my hallway and get right. Podcast. That's how this started. Or, you know, hey, I want to I want to move production studios in house to where I mean, do you remember when you used to do a video piece like it was five thousand dollars? It was a big deal. I they mean, it cost set a lot up of money. all the lights and all the shadow boxes and all this bullshit. And everybody had to have their hair done and, yep. you know, their crisp clothes on. And it was like, okay, here's a thumb drive that you spent six grand on, and you're going to have to live off of this forever. And uh, it's <laughs> just, right. that's right. It's just, it was just such a ridiculous concept. And, you know, my wife, who got into photography since she's not been practicing law as much, she got a nice Nikon camera, and, and then she wanted a Canon or vice versa. And so I was like, well, let me have your camera and we'll spend some money on lavalier mics and we'll get some nice lights and everything. And then we just started banging out. You know, like I, I always call it the, uh, oh, I always call it, now I can't remember what it is. But what was it like Big Brother and Real World, the, the the diary room? You know, kind of having this diary room deal. It's like, you know, you just got back from this case where you fought tooth and nail. And you know how when you have a good day in court, you you tell the same story fucking 50 times. Damn everybody. right you do. It's like, why not just go in and put it on a video and put it out there and let people see the, the glint in your eye and hear you talk about, you know, your, your victory or what if asshole this judge is or whatever the thing is and that humanizes you and 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 it's something other than walking down the steps of the federal courthouse with fucking seagulls flying behind you or whatever the the so attorneys in our age group i think some of the there's a lot of the older attorneys they're not going to just do it period um 
our age group, we're slow to do it. We're, we're, we're nervous about it. Putting a camera in our face makes us nervous. I, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about it. You know, I, yeah. I still am. You know, I, I, I know what I need to do. But you guys have got really kind of nice marketing pieces. I, you know, the, the one that you did where, where it starts off like those types of videos <laughs> that I'm talking about, you know. And, and that's, that, that's our whole, that's the whole thing we're doing. We're, it, it's going to be fun. And that's the whole, if you, that's the vision of, and we have a lot more that are coming out. So this is, this, this gets back to the whole money ball thing. I think if you haven't watched it or read it, uh, there's, there's, the, there's something that, that it sounds like what I'm saying is not a novel concept. There's, there's, there is a bigger crossover to what we do than I think a lot of us realize and taking the baseball metaphor even further and talking about pissing away a bunch of money on these website SEO companies is you, unless you have a huge war chest have got to figure out. And then, so it's, this is my money ball, Peter Thiel. We can't, we, we can't create our own lane in the law. We can't create a new practice of law that didn't exist. That's before. right. Generally speaking. I mean, you know, I'm sure there's going to be like fucking COVID law next year or something, but <laughs> generally speaking, you can't, you know, but you're saying a, we can differentiate with our marketing. Hit them where they're not. So that's a ba there's the baseball thing is you where what what aren't all my contemporaries doing? What you know, what is it that they're not doing? How can I what's my value proposition? How do I separate myself from everybody else? What is it that's going to be me that's not everybody else? And so um, this is something that I think about a lot. And, you know, I, people, you know, I posted a stupid video of me skateboarding out in the parking lot and I got like 700 likes on it in like 24 hours. Yeah, people don't. And oh, by the way, I'm an attorney. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, people, people, they don't, they don't even look anymore at the stodgy shit. Like they, people were, they've seen it so much that they're tuning out and they don't care. And a lot of the stuff we say posting, if you're posting it on pretty much any social media platform, except for LinkedIn, it's all about um, they people want emotional content that they can react to. And for the best I can tell for our, for what we do, the best emotion that we can play on is emotion that has humor to it or some sort of levity. Cause I mean, we, you, I, you and I could get on Instagram, but we're not going to wear tights and we're not going to do crazy. Gym thought about stuff. it. Thought about it. I was, uh, well, I mean, we could do it. We're just yeah. not going to get the likes that we want. Like that's not going to be it. We're not us. for the reasons that we want anyway. Right. But, uh, and I, what I was going to say earlier is we got to watch out for these young attorneys that are coming up. I mean, they're, you know, I'm looking and I'm seeing what they're doing on Instagram. And there's, there's these attorneys that are kids and they're just putting, you know, taking their phone, stick it in their face, like no production value really to it, but they're engaging, they're doing their thing and they're just getting tons of cases and they're, they're scaling up their businesses really quick. And, you know, in our age bracket, I don't know anyone that's really rocking Instagram, not for business. And then you got TikTok. That's well, coming so along. that was so and these same kids are jumping into TikTok now. Well, so I was list. I was at the time listening and watching a lot of Gary Vaynerchuk and his two big, he's like the two biggest bangs for your buck in social media marketing are LinkedIn and TikTok. And I, I had no idea what TikTok was. And I went on there and I was like, you know, girls that are a year older than my daughter dancing around in yoga right. pants. And I was just like. This this is the downfall of Western civilization, TikTok. Like this is I was starting to feel old watching that, just watching all these extremely young people dance and and, and, then, and then we didn't do anything. Well, Bruce Denson did it. He's like the only one who did it. And I don't know how well it's working out for him. I had him on and I was asking about it. Um, but I was like, I cannot conceive of a way to make that work for a law practice. And that was very difficult. Now, the great thing uh that I like about LinkedIn, especially when you're doing civil plaintiffs work, is the B2B aspect of it. You can go into LinkedIn and say, I want MRI people. Right. And it gives you a list of people to direct to, or I want chiropractors or with the first party property insurance stuff that Marie does. I want contractors. Right. I want remediation people. I want all this other stuff. So that's, what's great about that. If somehow Facebook could do that or Instagram could do that and you could, you know, kind of narrow the scope of who you're getting at and you can kind of do it. And yeah, you kind of do, but it. not as easy as you can with LinkedIn. I think Facebook and Instagram are better for, you know, going out to the consumers. Then go and be to be. I it's guess, but I, I wonder Facebook, like, I, I well, feel maybe that's where groups come into play. I'm yeah. A big group play. Yeah. Well, you know, and now they have this IGTV and the Facebook Live and all this other stuff. And I always watched like Matt Morgan used to do, you know, like a 
a Reddit or a, like a, you know, for the next three hours, I'm going to answer questions. <laughs> Ask me anything. Yeah. And I mean, you know, who's do, doing it. Do you know Eddie Reyes that shares the other half of this office? No. He, this is another part of what got me into it. This guy, he had like five careers before he became an attorney. He used to own a pain management clinic. He used to own a gym. He used to, he had this, this like mailer newspaper thing that he would go around and sell space to chiropractors and attorneys and have them like bid against each other. He was making like 50 grand a year, just creating this flyer that <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, but he's had this, he has this way of he's just a, figuring it a, out. He's a hustler. He's well, for 100%. And so he used to have, I don't know if it was this office, the one next to me, just, he would just rent out these two offices and he had this big wet board and he had Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and all this other stuff. And like, he knew that on Thursdays on Facebook from like two to this time was when this got the most, and he was just figuring out all this shit. And I was looking at him and it, so I've always been impressed by that thinking because I don't have it naturally. I have to work really hard to kind of like get my head in that space. But I've just, you know, I, I've always noticed that about you and, and, and you've, 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 you think in that way. And it's not in a way that I think naturally speaking. And then obviously when Lee came over and worked with you, I think maybe in a way it was such a great kind of response to who you are like you guys kind of have this yin and a yang thing to you would you agree absolutely yeah i mean I, he I, brings in skills he brought in skill sets to our group that he's the things that he's best at are the things that we're just weren't great at and uh and it was a, it's you know with nicole and i so it's it was a it was a really good pairing. he's 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 bold he's he's not afraid he's willing to you know i don't think he has imposter syndrome. Like I think he could litigate a case against whomever and it wouldn't, it would be no different from a first year law student or John Morgan or, you know, come up with whoever the, the, the Goliath is in that scenario. And I don't think he'd give a shit. He doesn't. Yeah. And I don't know if I, you know, he's, he's had a, he's had a bumpy life at spots, you know, with his brother and stuff in the military, you know, he's faced adversity. He's felt pain. He's, so, you know, maybe being on the other side of that is kind of a, I don't give a fuck mentality, but I, I think we, both of you have, have really benefited from each other in that way. Absolutely. And by the way, Nicole's amazing. It always seems like I'm, I'm scratching your and, and, and Lee's back. Nicole's amazing. And I know as equal a part of that scenario as. A, a, of course. Yes, yeah, she is. And, yeah. and she's, you know, she's kind of more, she's got. She's more level and grounded. She's your anchor, not your anchor, but your baseline or your, I, I don't know yep. what the and good she, metaphor she, would and be. And she's the one that makes sure that everything's taken care of. She's the one that handles the people. Yeah. You know, like I'm the one, I mean, I handle my group. I handle my PI division and Lee handles his crime division. Paul works with us. He handles the divorce division, but Nicole's the one that handles everybody from the top level. And there's, I, you know, maybe because I'm kind of analytical with how I think sometimes when I'm dealing with my staff, the bedside I manner is a little may bit not, not be there. Yeah. They get nervous yeah. and they don't they don't feel comfortable around me. Yeah. You know, and I work I try to work on that. But, it, you know, it's who I am. Uh, but she's always there. She's everyone can always go to the person who's in charge. And that's why she's the one that, you know, she's the one that's in charge. In her firm. But 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 just divisions and delegating that like it's only it's not even really there yet. But I've just always worn all the hats and done it all. And it just it kills you. You know, you can't, you it can't, kills you, can't you. You have to delegate. You, ha you have to. You can't do everything because then you do everything shitty. Shitty. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. But it's it's not easy. It's not easy. And I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you seem to have figured it out. So that was that was the, one of the big reasons that I, I wanted to have you on is because of all the people I see out there in, in my age range, you know, a lot of them never get past them and a paralegal or them and a receptionist. And they just, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can do that and that's fine. And you can make a good buck and do it till you close your shop. But, it, it, you know, you have gotten to that next tier. And I look at these firms and, you know, I've always you and Mike Lundy, I kind of look at, and I'm just, because, you know, Mike, Mike and I are about the same age. I'm 45. He's going to be 40. He's 45. Now he's going to be 46. I'm 44. I'll be 45 in December. Um, but within this kind of age range where we're not young, but we're not old, right. you know, but you, you know, there's kind of this, I feel like we're kind of getting into this space where it's like, you got to figure it out now or else, you know, you're going to be locked in. Well, yeah. I mean, what do, you, what, do you, you know, what do you want to be? Right. Yeah. And if you want to build something that's going to, 
like you said, it's going to earn that passive income. And, yeah. and what it, that's what is a business, really, right? A business is I've created something, I'm the owner of it. And as the owner of it, after it does all of its thing, at the end, there should be some money that comes out. And I get that just because I'm the owner, not because right. I'm the guy working on it. Right. Completely different than that. Which right? is a very hard concept to wrap your brain around. Especially for lawyers. Because we're work, for, we work in it so much. Especially for a child of two school teachers. Like, <laughs> I still to this day hate asking people for money. Like, it, it's a it's a fucking weird thing for me. Like, and I underquote retainers and I cut stupid deals to friends and I do all this stupid shit that I know better than doing. But it's uh, the, the idea of making well, I, I shouldn't say it that way to say making money that I didn't work for, because that's not really what it is, but it feels that way to me. That's kind of the weird kind of, you know, subconscious feeling I get behind it. There's always a place to have a heart, but you just have to realize when you're doing it that you are effectively stealing from your family. Yeah. You know, or, or you're intentionally choosing to do that because you want, you personally want to do the work for free. And I think and that, sometimes you want to do that, but I know what you're talking about. Sometimes our heart gets in the way too much, yeah. or too many good causes. And then, you know, and then what's happening? And then maybe you're going to work the case. So all of a sudden now your, your firm loses out because you're one of, you're the best producer, right? Yeah. And you're doing work for free. You shouldn't be, or you delegate it down to an associate who's not happy because they're doing something that, that sucks and you're losing money on the associate and you're mad you're losing money on your associate. Right. I mean, you just have to, there's an idea. We, we do this. It's, there's a guy who wrote a book called profit first. And uh -huh. the idea is, you know, make sure that no matter what happens at the end of the day, you send me a reading list for sure. Okay, cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's a really easy read and it's, it's, it's the concepts real simple. Sure. It's, just, it's just a surprising concept and it's, you know, pay, pay yourself first. Yeah. So every month, figure out whatever, you know, figure out your profit, whatever it is that you're going to make. And you stick it into an account every month, uh -huh. figure out what you're going to need to pay for taxes as a business. You yeah. stick it into another account and don't get access to it. Make it so it's not a place yeah. that you can yeah. see. Cause sometimes we look at our operating account and we think things are good, but yeah. you know, it's a lot better to, you know, you move the money first and then right. you run your business and it forces you to run your fucking business yeah. and make sure your business is profitable. And at the end, whatever your profit percentage is, if you get more great, but whatever, at the end of the day, you get an owner's distribution, that's going to be, you know, let's say you set it at 10%. Right. You know, if you're running a $5 million firm, you get 10%. That's nice to set it and forget it and to know that that's going to be there. And it holds you accountable. Do you feel comfortable? Like, do you feel like it, 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 it requires you to touch it every day? Or do you feel like, like it is kind of running itself now? I think it runs itself, but it needs to, we're at, we're still at that. We still got to get better and better every day. So yeah. I think that we should be touching it every, every week. And yeah. again, you, you know, they kind of get muddled, right? Managing your people. Well, but yeah, it depends on what you're talking right, about. Yeah. Managing your people, that's important. And that's, that's, but that's management. That's not actually the, you know, the business itself. Right. So, um, I think the business itself, the container of the business should effectively run itself as long as we're making sure that we're not taking too much money out of sure. it so that it can build. Um, but I think you have to keep working on it, keep making your systems better. Recognize that the world is continuing to change. And if you're not leveraging tech, for example, to get more work done, whatever that might be for, for less labor dollars or zero labor dollars, then you're losing out and yeah. you're going to screw up because other cause younger lawyers are going to figure it out. They're going to eat our lunch from an operations perspective. And then, of course, we were talking about the marketing perspective, which is the most important thing. Um, you know, look at the younger attorneys and see what they're doing as well, especially if you're a small firm. You don't have a lot of dollars like you were talking. Right. About. I mean, if you got dollars and you can put ad spend, hey, you're in business. Like if I had, you know, if we if we had 20 million dollar firms and we had those that budget, if yeah. we had multi million dollar year ad spend then we would be spending our time figuring out how to make the best creative. Sure. Right. That's what yeah. I would be spending my time with. Yeah. Um, and professional creative. But I know we don't have that ad spend. You're still got to figure out how to make the best creative. But, you know, you're going to be doing it with your cell phone. Doing it. Yeah. And Organically quick. DOI, which I kind of dig. I, I, you know, I, 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 hence the kind of punk metal skateboarder ethos in here. This, this, uh, this is not by accident. This is kind of a representation of my mind space when I was going through all these other things. And, uh, you know, one of the big punk ethos is, is was DIY, you know, like we're going to press our own records. We're going to make our own record slips. We're going right to do right. our own concert posters. You know, we're going to go play at people's houses. Like, 
we're going to create a path for ourselves that didn't exist before. So all of that kind of circles through my mind. And, and, and because I don't have that ad spend, part of my mind is, you know, how can I do this in a punk way? I've got all these book titles, you know, punk rock attorney, all these other things out there that I've, I've thought about. But, um, you know, how can you find a way to market without having that money? And, you know, I've done this long enough now that, I, when you left the PD, I don't know, was Yellow Book still where people were losing their shirts? Yeah. Do you remember that? I yeah. Mean, like, yeah. oh, a half page ad is $4,000 a month. And it's just like. I remember getting calls for it going, no way. Well, so there was that. And then direct mail. Everybody was doing direct mail. Yep, and yep. then, you know, uh, then it was websites and everybody was spending shit tons yeah, of now money. Websites are not quite the yellow pads, but it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, you. So this is where I'm going with my question is like, I, I'm interested in where you see it going or where you see it at currently, you know, like I know there's a big thing about the texting, like, you know, getting text stuff or geo site, uh, geolocation, like, you know, Oh, I'm near an emergency room here. Are all these PI attorney yeah, ads yeah. that pop up, or, you know, I said something near Siri about, my back hurting and all of a sudden my cell phone is populated with. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Have you, how, what you thought about the future of marketing? So I, you know, I listened to some Gary Vaynerchuk too, mm -hmm. and he, he says this over and over again. He goes, you know, right now, you know, you can get on, you can pay for a click on Google and somebody's going to click on you. But what are you going to do 10 years from now when a person has their little implanted device and it says, Hey, uh, you know, Hey Siri, get me a lawyer mm -hmm. and in, or, you know, Hey, Amazon, right. And get me a lawyer. Like, what are you going to do then? You're going to make, cause everything's going to be owned by Amazon and people are not even be searching anymore. Right. right. In, in some cases. And he's like, you better be in the position that people are going, Hey, get me Sally Jones. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, uh, I, I, I don't, I think he's a hundred percent right. I mean, don't you, right. If yeah. people want it easier and easier and easier and the idea of branding, and that's what we've been really pushing on. And, uh, you know, especially because with PI, you have to do yeah. branding. I mean, you, yeah. you want to be top of mind. Um, I mean, I think that's the key. So I think, you know, where's it going to go in the future? People are always going to, I, people are definitely people, especially younger than us are finding attorneys and DMing them on Instagram for Christ's sake. Right. Yeah. I, I didn't realize this. Like yes. I'm not really on Instagram and yeah. I, I am now. I don't even know how to use it. Well, I I'm figuring it out. I'm damn sure figuring yeah. it out yeah. because you know, these young attorneys are, these, and that these was, guys are that was Gary Vee's point about TikTok. He's, he's like, TikTok may not be the app that does it for you, but it's going to teach you how to do. Right. Get, go to where people's eyeballs are. Yeah. Right. Figure so, out the way that they're thinking and looking at things and all this. Other stuff. But the other thing that keeps me up at night is, the auto you you talked about the automation of jobs or work or whatever and you know you see legal zoom and you see some of these other things and between the legislature effectively doing what they can to kill certain aspects of the law so you know people you know uh, there was there was a period there where bankruptcies were going bananas mortgage foreclosure defense was going bananas you know, BP litigation or whatever, whatever the, law, the, the big business lawmakers fix it every time. right? Well, that's just it. So, you know, that's the other thing is, you know, I don't know how divorce ever goes away, but I, I can see it becoming gradually more and more automated to where it, it requires less input by an attorney. Um, and with PI. Do you ever think about this? Yeah. Look, you, we love being lawyers. And so we do. No, we don't. I don't. But anyway, go I, ahead. I, I love I love. I, I, I love going difference. to court. I love, I love being a lawyer. Yeah. But if we were smarter, if we were, if we were Spock, if we were Vulcans, why wouldn't we just spend all of our time figuring out how to be good advertisers and marketers and brand cases and outsource every single goddamn one? 100%. And so like, uh, you know, when I was first getting into PI, I used to go and, and I don't, I, I'm not being insulting, but I, I always have this thing with people where, I have two minds. I have my naive mind and my conspiracy theory mind where at first I'm like, oh, this all sounds amazing. And then I'm like, this person's probably completely full of shit. And I and I, I have a hard time sometimes rectifying those. <laughs> but uh, there, I, I'm going to say a name and I'm not saying anything bad about this person, but Matt Dolman over in Clearwater, Clearwater, he was really into all this. And he was a part of this group of attorneys. And there's this guy up in Jacksonville who basically 
was doing exactly what you're describing, um, which is basically creating almost like a, an aggregator or like a price line for attorneys or an Ask Gary or whatever, you know, whatever the different models were about it is. And and, and so then another thing was interesting to me. So my, my wife's family, um, this should have probably been a lunch because this is more just me stealing your ideas. Um, my my wife's father was an orthodontist and her uncle was an orthodontist. And her dad is, he will come in in the middle of the night to work on- Which your, one was in Brandon? They both were. Oh, one, um, one of them did my teeth. Well, the, so there's Eddie Gonzalez and then there's Dr. John Basiglio. And that uh, yeah, that's her Basiglio. dad. Um, but the, the, the uncle- I think objectively speaking, did way better financially than her dad did. And Eddie's a great orthodontist and all this stuff, but it wasn't better than her dad, but was way better at marketing. Like you, you would go, we'd go to the, you know, the movie theater and he would have his, you know, family orthodontist, all this stuff and all the kids smiling and just, you know, the concept of the people who do the best in an industry are not the best at that industry, the, the specific profession. They're the best at the marketing uh, of it. So getting back to your Vulcan Spock analogy, and can you occupy both those worlds? Can you be, can you have the service quality and be the best at the marketing? And I mean, intellectually, I think that you can be, but it almost always seems like you're having to make a decision between the two. Yeah, I, well, I think because you only have so, so many, so much time yourself. Right. But I mean, if that's what you wanted to do, you could just make sure you have whatever you're, whatever one you want to focus on, that's what you focus on. Yeah. And hire a top line son of, you know, person to focus on the other part because they do go together. Yeah. But, you know, it's not quality of the legal work that really matters. You know this and I know this. It's quality of the customer experience and them feeling like they're, they, they don't, you could settle a case for $10,000 and it could be a great resolution or it could be the most sinister, worst resolution of all time. You could settle a case for a million dollars. It could be an amazing resolution. It could be horrendous. The client has no idea. Mm -hmm. They don't know. Mm -hmm. right? But what they do know is that if, if you answer their phone calls. Did right? I get to talk to an attorney? Yeah, did I talk to his, Yeah. These, did they take cool? me seriously? Did he, did, he, did he meet me at Panera? Uh -huh. You know, I do that I, every week. Uh -huh. you know, well, a lot less now because of what's going on. Yeah. Right? You know, I mean, you try to build bonds and stuff like that. And that's what they know. And so it makes sense to put resources into that because then they become your fans and then they start referring cases to you. So right. that, I mean, that's half of it. I think ideally you're, you're making sure you do both. If you are, if you are, if you have operations, if you are actually creating a product, which is what we do, we have a product, we have a start and a finish. But if you're just a marketing firm, I mean, that's honestly, that's probably the smartest thing for us to do. For sure. You know, you know, the, you know, Josh's, Josh's marketing, think of yourself as just a marketing agent. Josh's market, marketing agent. Become that's business people are. instead of lawyers. Cause that's the thing. That's, that's you right. know, you, the lawyers are not trained to be business people. And, and one the, the, day, one day Florida is going to let one day, probably it'll be a long time, but one day Florida is going to let non-lawyers become, um, you know, run law firms and yeah. things are going to change real fast. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, anyway, I'll, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get off law and then I'll let you go. Cause we've, we've, we've gone past our hour, but, um, uh, is this is this how you see your life going or do you see a, a life after this at some point? You know, my 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 parents had a, a poor golden years. They were school teachers. They had their house paid off, but their health was such that they didn't really get to enjoy their life after this profession. Do you think about that at all? Like, do you think of a point where you're not doing this anymore? Or? No. I did a couple of years ago, but I, but now you're one thing I did was I changed what I was doing. So all I do is you know, injury litigation and yeah. it's just, it's just a better quality of life. It fits my personality. It's just better. I'm right. happier. Um, we worked really hard to make sure that our, our business did run, you know, we, we got good people, you know, we figured out how to get good people, like top people, people that bring things in the organization that make us better, mm -hmm. things that I don't know. For sure. Um, and people that are, are responsible and can get things done without us intervening too much. Yeah. And so when that runs that way, now it's a little different. Now we feel pretty good. You know, now it's about making sure let's plan in advance. I mean, we got the kids and you know how it is with kids, but let's plan in advance to make sure we have the vacation time we need and, right. and we take our time for ourselves. And I, I think, I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. Well, Plus hourly, Airbnb's hourly, you appear to be doing a pretty good job of it. So at least you got that not nailed down. <laughs> right. Anyway, well, thank you so much for coming by. Uh, I really appreciate talking to you. It, 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 it checked off a lot of the boxes that I wanted to because I love 
having these conversations with people, but very rarely do you get to have them with people, uh, you know, except that maybe business lunches or, or right. at, at meetings with your, with your colleagues in your office. But it's interesting to me, you know, I've, I've had a, a sea change in my view of what owning a law practice is. And so the more I think about it, the more keen I am to see who is doing it well in the community. And again, you guys are doing it well. So Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, I know it's a Friday afternoon and you probably have been with the girls, either the kids or the or the wife. But uh, what's your date night look like? Uh, we're going, in the, in the we're going phase to a, of COVID. We're going to a hotel for the first time Ooh, since the face of COVID. So we got nice. a room at the Don. Oh, yeah. The Don's uh, nice. We were sweet with a with a patio and we're just going to a little champagne. That'll around. be nice. Have a good time. We were supposed to. And if, in fact, I got to cancel it. My wife and I were going to do St. Augustine next weekend, but we just. Uh, ended up getting a, a place down in Anna Maria and now I can't afford coffee. <laughs> yeah. It's Fair ramen enough. noodles and Fair enough. yeah. Hanging out on the beach. But anyway, all right. Thank you so much for, for coming by Christian. Thanks, I really Josh, appreciate, I appreciate it. it. All right.